Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio for Friday, April 26, 2024. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin announces a $6 billion military aid package for Ukraine, which includes more Patriot air defense missiles. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has asked for those missiles, but also for more Patriot systems to counter Russia's air bombardment of his country. Secretary of State Antony Blinken meets with Chinese President Xi Jinping in Beijing, telling him China needs to reduce its support of Russia's defense industry or face consequences from the U.S. They also discuss Chinese policy on the economy and trade. Secretary Blinken at a news conference also asked about pro-Palestinian protests at many universities and colleges in the United States. And we'll hear from two governors about those campus protests in their states, Florida's Ron DeSantis and California's Gavin Newsom. In campaign 2024, President Joe Biden does an interview with Sirius XM radio host Howard Stern, in which he says he once thought of killing himself when his first wife and baby daughter were killed, and that he'd be happy to debate his likely presidential re-election campaign opponent, Donald Trump. We'll also get Donald Trump's reaction to that. And former Congressman Jim Cooper, Democrat of Tennessee, reflects on the 45 years since the U.S. House of Representatives put cameras in to cover floor debate, and C-SPAN started broadcasting it all live, gavel to gavel. From Associated Press, the U.S. will provide Ukraine additional Patriot missiles for its air defense systems as part of a massive $6 billion additional aid package, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin announced Friday. The missiles will be used to replenish previously supplied Patriot air defense systems and are part of a package that will also include more munitions for the National Advanced Surface to air missile systems, and additional gear to integrate Western air defense launchers, missiles, and radars into Ukraine's existing weaponry, much of which still dates back to the Soviet era. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky discussed the need for patriots early Friday at the Ukraine Defense Contact Group, a coalition of about 50 countries gathering virtually in a Pentagon-led meeting. The meeting fell on the second anniversary of the group, which Secretary Austin said had moved heaven and earth since April 2022 to source millions of rounds of ammunition, rocket systems, armored vehicles, and even jets to help Ukraine rebuff Russia's invasion. That was the reporting from Associated Press. President Zelensky began by thanking the nations for providing additional resources. The U.S. National Security Supplemental Spending Package, just signed into law, has $61 billion. And then he spoke about the need for patriots. This year, Russian jets has already used more than 9,000 guided aerial bombs against Ukraine. And we need the ability to shoot down their combat aircraft so that they do not approach our positions and borders. It is possible. It is just as possible as giving protection to the cities of Ukraine from Russian rockets. We urgently need Patriot systems and missiles for them. This is what can and should save lives right now. At least seven Petros are necessary for our cities to be safe. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky speaking virtually to a meeting of the Ukraine Defense Contact Group. It included at the Pentagon, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and General Charles C.Q. Brown, Chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Later, the secretary and chair held a news conference, and the secretary was asked about the Patriot missiles. Mr. Secretary, President Zelensky this morning made it clear that his country needs Patriot systems, not just the munitions that go with it. Uh, Can you say how much, if any, progress you all made today on that, considering a number of allies have expressed reluctance in sending these systems that they just don't have very many of? Well, thanks, Lita. Uh, in terms of patriots and what we'll be able to do going forward, it's left to be seen. But I can tell you that uh, we continue to work on this uh, in in a very earnest manner. Um, all of the countries that have patriots certainly value uh, that capability. But, uh, but I think uh, going forward, we'll be able to hopefully work with a number of countries to to put together additional Patriot capability. And you may have noticed that uh, in the last several days, I've been talking uh, one-on-one uh, with uh, some of my European counterparts, actually discussing this issue and other issues. But, uh, but again, um, we're going to continue to work at this until we, we have the right kinds of capability. 
Now, I, I would point out that it's not just Patriot that, uh, that, you know, they need. They need other types of systems and interceptors as well. And so uh, I would caution us all in terms of making Patriot the silver bullet. Uh, I would say that it's going gonna, it's gonna to be the integrated air and missile defense, as we've said so many times before, that really uh, turns the tide. And so there are other capabilities that they need that, that we really pushed hard to get. And we may be able to get to, uh, to the Ukrainians uh, a bit faster. But this work continues on. And, and, uh, and you know that uh, Jens Stoltenberg talked to all the ministers of defense on this very same issue a week ago. Um, and in addition to the point-to-point -point work that I'm doing with my colleagues, uh, you know, we'll continue to emphasize that, uh, that countries uh, are going to have to uh, – we'll, we're going to ask them to accept a little bit more risk so that uh, we can do what's necessary uh, in, uh, in Ukraine. So. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin in the Pentagon briefing room at a news conference, joined by General Charles Z.Q. Brown, chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who was asked about Ukraine's chances of success in the war with Russia. And General Brown, can Ukraine win? Well, you know, the key part here is to make sure Ukraine can defend itself. And uh, as the Secretary Highlight and I have talked about here recently is that, uh, you know, unchecked aggression leads to more aggression. And, and so this is why it is so important for us to put uh, Ukraine in a place that it can defend itself and that uh, we don't have this uh, broaden um, to a, a much wider uh, conflict. And when I think about how World War II started or previous world wars, um, this is why this is so important that the, we have Ukraine Defense Contact Group and, and all the nations around the world that are focused on ensuring Ukraine is successful. General Charles C.Q. Brown, chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff at a news conference at the Pentagon. Earlier this week, the White House announced $1 billion in weapons and equipment for Ukraine, including air defense munitions and artillery rounds, which can be sent quickly because they are already in Pentagon stocks, in some cases at warehouses in Europe. Another Associated Press article, Ukraine has sidelined U.S.-provided Abrams M1A1 battle tanks for now in its fight against Russia, in part because... Russian drone warfare has made it too difficult for them to operate without detection or coming under attack, two U.S. military officials told the Associated Press. The U.S. agreed to send 31 Abrams to Ukraine in January 2023 after an aggressive months-long campaign by Kyiv, arguing that the tanks, which cost about $10 million apiece, were vital to its ability to breach Russian lines. Five of the 31 tanks have already been lost to Russian attacks. That from Associated Press. The war in Ukraine also came up today during Secretary of State Antony Blinken's visit to China. This is from the Wall Street Journal. Secretary Blinken urged Chinese leader Xi Jinping to cut back on his nation's support for Russia's defense industry during a meeting in the Chinese capital on Friday and warned that the U.S. was prepared to act if Beijing didn't heed its concerns. Secretary Blinken spoke at a news conference. In my discussions today, I reiterated our serious concern about the PRC providing components that are powering Russia's brutal war of aggression against Ukraine. China is the top supplier of machine tools, microelectronics, nitrocellulose, which is critical to making munitions and rocket propellants, and other dual-use items that Moscow is using to ramp up its defense industrial base. A defense industrial base that is churning out rockets, drones, tanks, and other weapons that President Putin is using to invade a sovereign country to demolish its power grid and other civilian infrastructure, to kill innocent children, women, and men. Russia would struggle to sustain its assault on Ukraine without China's support. In my meetings with NATO allies earlier this month and with our G7 partners just last week, I heard that same message. Fueling Russia's defense industrial base not only threatens Ukrainian security, it threatens European security. Beijing cannot achieve better relations with Europe while supporting the greatest threat to European security since the end of the Cold War. As we told China for some time, ensuring transatlantic security is a core U.S. interest. In our discussions today, I made clear that if China does not address this problem, we will. Secretary of State Antony Blinken at a news conference in Beijing after that meeting with Chinese President Xi Jinping. Story from NBC News. The two men met Friday afternoon local time at the Great Hall of the People, an ornate and cavernous building next to Tiananmen Square. Xi noted that this year is the 45th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations between the U.S. and China and said the two countries should be partners rather than adversaries. 
The world is big enough to accommodate the simultaneous development and prosperity of both China and the United States, he said, according to a Chinese foreign ministry readout, adding that the U.S.-China relations will stabilize once the U.S. takes a positive and constructive view of China's development. Speaking to reporters after the meeting, again, this is from the NBC News article, Secretary Blinken said the U.S. did not aim to hold back China's development or decouple the world's two largest economies. Here is Secretary Blinken at the news conference talking about his conversations on the economy and trade practices. I also expressed our concern about the PRC's unfair trade practices and the potential consequences of industrial overcapacity for global and U.S. markets, especially in a number of key uh, industries that will drive the 21st century economy, like solar panels, uh, electric vehicles, and the batteries that power them. China alone is producing more than 100% of global demand for these products, flooding markets, undermining competition, putting at risk livelihoods and businesses around the world. Now, this is a movie that we've seen before, uh, and we know how it ends, with American businesses shuttered and American jobs lost. President Biden will not let this happen on his watch. We'll do what's necessary to ensure that American workers can compete on a level playing field. America's actions are not aimed at holding back China's development, nor are we decoupling our economies. As Secretary Yellen said during her recent visit, that would be disastrous for the global economy, including for the United States. We want China's economy to grow. So do the American businesses and investors here, uh, several of whom I had an opportunity to speak to in Shanghai. But the way China grows matters. As I told my counterparts, that means fostering a healthy economic relationship where American workers and firms are treated equally and fairly. Secretary of State Antony Blinken at a news conference in Beijing. Ending a week of meetings with Chinese officials, including today with President Xi Jinping. Some other issues on the agenda include Chinese aggression in the South China Sea, Taiwan, North Korea's nuclear and missile programs, and the Israel-Hamas war. A reporter at the news conference asked about a related issue, the wave of pro-Palestinian protests that have popped up at dozens of U.S. colleges and universities, many demanding that the schools divest any relationship with Israel or Israeli companies. Well, we're on the Middle East. I, I think we can't ignore uh, some of the images that have been coming out from back in the U.S. from uh, university campuses. Um, it's quite striking to see, you know, students, um, some of the violence in, in these protests, but, but students all across your country are coming out and, and expressing their outrage at what's happening in, in, in Gaza. Are you taking on board... Uh, those protests, you know, what do you say to uh, young people, young Americans who, um, you know, see this as, as a moment when they need to um, speak out against their government? Uh, in terms of the uh, protests back home, look, again, I'm not, uh, it's not my practice to, to comment on uh, domestic uh, matters, but look, people have strong, passionate feelings. Um, about what's happening in Gaza uh, and in the Middle East that I very much understand. And when we see the horrific human suffering uh, and the death of children, women, and men who are caught in this crossfire Hamas is making, um, it's gut-wrenching, as I've said before. And we want to do everything we can to bring it to an end. Um, and in our own country, it's uh, a hallmark of our democracy that our citizens make known their views, their concerns, their, uh, their anger at any given time. Um, and I think that reflects the, uh, the strength of the country, the strength of democracy. Now, as I've also said before, this could be over tomorrow. It could have been over yesterday. It could have been over months ago. If Hamas had put down its weapons, stopped hiding behind civilians, released the hostages, uh, and surrendered. But of course, it uh, has chosen not to do that. And it is also notable that there is silence about Hamas. Uh, it's as if it wasn't even part of the, uh, the story. But as 
I've also said repeatedly, um, the, the way Israel goes about ensuring that October 7th never happens again matters profoundly, and we're working every day uh, to try to minimize the damage that's done to innocent people and to make sure that they have the assistance and support that they need. Secretary of State Antony Blinken at a news conference in Beijing. From the Washington Post, more than 500 people have been detained over the past week in pro-Palestinian protests at colleges across the United States. Students, many demanding that their institutions cut ties with corporations doing business with Israel, have continued to gather on campuses despite the presence of police and exhortations from administrators. That was from the Washington Post. One of the newest encampments from protesters is at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. WTOP Radio in Washington reports that George Washington University officials said in a statement that individuals who remain on University Yard and any who attempt to join them are trespassing on private property and violating university regulations. The university said it's working with D.C. police to secure the area and will pursue disciplinary action against the GW students involved in these unauthorized demonstrations that continue to disrupt university operations. Also, the protests have disrupted the law school's finals, which were set to be held in buildings next to the protest encampment and have been moved to another building due to the noise. That was from WTOP Radio. WUFT-TV writes, the University of Florida threatened pro-Palestinian student demonstrators with suspension and banishment from campus for three years if they violate a host of rules of behavior over protests that have continued for a second day late Thursday. The university said employees or professors caught breaking its rules would be fired. And from the Tallahassee Democrat, this headline, FSU police sprinklers put damper on pro-Palestinian student protest Occupy Landis plans. The governor of Florida, Ron DeSantis, a Republican, spoke at a news conference on Thursday. It was called on a different subject originally about what's happening in his state with these protests. You think about what happened when you have these Hamas demonstrators out. They're taking over bridges and they're taking over roads. Um, And first of all, you don't have a right to do that. You have someone get stuck in traffic. How do you know if someone, someone may need to get to a hospital, someone may need to pick up a child somewhere, and you're just going to commandeer the road uh, because you're, you, you have this, uh, this ideological predilection? They tried to do that in Miami, and what happened? In 10 minutes, they got dragged off the road where they belonged, and we're not going to tolerate that. You look at... You look at these universities. We, when we have students who are doing things that, I mean, look, some of the stuff with the Hamas, I think is absurd that someone would go out and, and demonstrate on that. But, you know, when you're chasing Jewish students around, when you're not letting a, a Jewish professor enter a building, when you're targeting people like that, that's not, that's not free speech. I mean, that, that's harassment. That violates appropriate conduct. And yet, at Columbia, at Yale, all these places, those guys, those folks rule the roost. They do whatever they want. And, and these administrators and the presidents of these universities are weak. Uh, they're scared, and they don't do anything. You know, you do that in Florida at, at our universities, we're showing you the door. You're going to be expelled uh, when you're doing that stuff. And you know what? The minute people start to face consequences, you are not going to see uh, this nonsense going on. So I think the approach is very important. We know the approach that these prosecutors have taken in San Francisco, Chicago, Baltimore has failed. And of all the actions you can take, uh, the suspension in Hillsborough and in Orange um, counties with those state attorneys, uh, you talk to law enforcement on the ground, uh, lives have been saved because we have people in there now who take the law seriously and put the protection of the public above their personal political agenda. And that makes a huge difference. And we're going to continue to stand for law and order. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, Republican, on Thursday at a news conference. Also on Thursday in California, Governor Gavin Newsom, a Democrat, was asked about University of Southern California in Los Angeles protests. 
Last night, 93 students were arrested uh, at USC in pro-Palestine protests. Do you believe that that was the right response? I don't know the details of the police enforcement on the campus. I'm aware of that. Uh, I met yesterday uh, with uh, our team, Office of Emergency Services, our mutual aid uh, framework. Uh, we met with uh, President Drake, uh, met personally, my office yesterday as it relates to the UC campuses. And, uh, my team in contact with the sheriff up in Humboldt, and so we're working uh, with the trustees uh, and with the university systems as it relates to our public role and responsibility. Uh, and so we're very mindful of what's going on in the campuses and want to maintain a people's right to protest, at the same time do so peacefully uh, without any hate. Uh, and we don't want uh, any, any more. Uh, of, you know, I, I just want to avoid a lot of what we're seeing. Uh, in other parts of uh, the uh, country. And so we're, we're very mindful and diligent in terms of trying to approach this in, a, in an appropriate uh, way uh, and address uh, the concern, the growing concern people have about what's going on on our campuses, not just in California, but across the country. California Governor Gavin Newsom, Democrat, at a news conference on Thursday. From the LA Times, USC announced Thursday that it is canceling its main May commencement ceremony, capping a dramatic series of moves that began last week after it informed the valedictorian who had been opposed by pro-Israel groups that she would not be delivering the traditional speech. In ending the university-wide May 10th graduation ceremony altogether, President Carol Fold aimed to quell the controversy that grew as the school chipped away at core parts of the ritual, drawing criticism from both pro-Palestinian and pro-Israel activists. The cancellation took place amid unrest on university campuses across the nation stemming from the Israel-Hamas war. That reporting from the LA Times. Washington Today continues in a moment. Hi there, I'm Jonathan from C-SPAN, along with my colleague, Ben. Since C-SPAN's founding 45 years ago, the media world has changed. Remember when there were just a few TV channels? Now we've got streaming, social media, apps, and more. Through all of this, C-SPAN has stayed true to its mission of giving you unfiltered access to government wherever you get your news. As we navigate this challenging media environment with fewer people subscribing to traditional cable packages, our funding has been impacted. That's why we're asking for your help to keep going strong for another 45 years. Please donate today at cspan.org slash donate. Your contribution, large or small, helps ensure at least another 45 years of witnessing democracy in action. Keep C-SPAN thriving in today's ever-changing media landscape. Visit cspan.org slash donate to make your gift today. Thank you. Welcome back to Washington Today, available as a podcast wherever you find your podcasts and on the free C-SPAN Now mobile app. President Joe Biden in New York City for campaign fundraising made a surprise stop. TMZ reports that Joe Biden opening up about his mental health struggles, saying he once considered taking his own life in one particularly low moment, but his kids saved him. POTUS sat down for an interview with Howard Stern on his Sirius XM show Friday and spoke about his first wife and their infant daughter dying in a 1972 car crash, admitting he briefly thought about suicide. That was from TMZ. Here's a portion of the interview. I can understand you don't have to be nuts to commit suicide. I used to say, I don't, I said, I don't drink. I, that's not a, va- a virtue. I just never I drank. I, I never drank. And uh, I used to sit there and think to myself, I'm just going to take out a bottle of scotch that was, we always had liquor in the house, in my, in my, in my house as well. And I, I, I was going to just drink it and get drunk. And I, I can never bring myself to do it. And I actually thought about, you know, you, you, you don't have to be crazy to commit suicide. If you've been to the top of the mountain, you think it's never going to be there again. And you, and uh, just a brief moment, I thought, maybe i just go to the Delaware Memorial Bridge and jump. But wow. but I had two kids. I mean, it wasn't, don't get me wrong, I wasn't like, I got to commit suicide. It was like, you've been to the top of the mountain and it's never going to happen again. You're never going to be okay. But, it, but I had, and I, I had... And my boys, my boys, when I started, to, we started to date Jill. We started to date Jill. Well, you- President Biden interviewed today by Howard Stern on his Sirius XM radio show. He also went on to urge anyone who needs help because of thoughts of suicide to reach out. It was an hour-long interview. It covered many topics. 
CNN writes that President Joe Biden said he will debate former President Donald Trump ahead of this year's election, the clearest declaration yet of his willingness to face off with his Republican rival before voters cast ballots in November. I don't know if you're going to debate your uh, your opponent. I am somewhere. I don't know when. Yeah. I, I'm happy to debate him. And Donald Trump in New York City responding. I just want to say that I've invited Biden to debate. He can do it anytime he wants, including tonight. I'm ready. Here we are. I invited him to the courthouse that he has us tied up in with his administration. This is all being done through Washington. It's all a well-coordinated attack on a political opponent. But I'm here. I'm ready, willing, and able. And if he wants, I'll do it on Monday night, Tuesday night, or Wednesday night. We'll be in Michigan, a state that he's destroyed because of the auto industry. We're not going to have any jobs left in Michigan. No auto jobs left in Michigan. They're all going over to China and other places with this ridiculous EV mandate, electric vehicle mandate. But we're willing to do it Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, or Friday night on national television. We're ready. Just tell me where. Now, we'll do it in the White House. That would be very comfortable, actually. But you tell me where. But we're ready. He's obviously not showing up now. We heard nothing. But he said today that, oh, I'd love to debate, but he won't debate. I don't think he'll debate. Maybe he will. Maybe he will. I'm not sure he has a choice. But that's the story. So here we are. We're ready, willing, and able. And uh, we don't see him, and I don't think he'll be here. But maybe next week he'll do it. I doubt it, but maybe next week. Former President Donald Trump in New York City. The Commission on Presidential Debates has scheduled three presidential debates for September and October in Texas, Virginia, and Utah. Donald Trump is in New York City where he is attending the criminal trial where he's accused of business reporting fraud to cover up payments to keep a damaging story about him out of the news in the 2016 presidential election, what is known as the hush money trial earlier in the day. He spoke to reporters wishing his wife, Melania, a happy birthday. She turns 54 years old today. He said it would have been nice to be with her, but I'm in a courthouse for a rigged trial. And from JustTheNews.com, the House Judiciary Committee released a new report on Thursday which accuses Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg of pursuing a political prosecution against former President Donald Trump. The report concluded... Since at least 2018, the DANY has weaponized the criminal justice system, scouring every aspect of President Trump's personal life and business affairs going back decades in the hopes of finding some legal basis, however far-fetched, novel, or convoluted, to bring charges against him. That from JustTheNews.com. Former Congresswoman Liz Cheney, Republican from Wyoming, who was vice chair of the House Committee investigating the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol, was interviewed this week by presidential historian John Meacham. Liz Cheney lost a campaign primary for re-election to a candidate endorsed by Donald Trump. Liz Cheney is the author of Oath and Honor, a memoir and a warning. And she was asked how her warnings about Donald Trump's campaign to regain the White House have been received. Can you please elaborate, it's a good question, on how your message is being received outside of Washington and the rest of the country? What resonates most among ordinary voters who may be less open to your view? Yeah, you know, I I spend a lot of time uh, traveling around the country and speaking. Um, I speak on a lot of college campuses, uh, and 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 I've been really heartened by um, the the extent to which people are engaged. They're they're. Um, they're, they're seized with how important the election is. They understand what's at stake. Um, they want to know what can they do to make sure um, that Trump doesn't get anywhere near the Oval Office again. Um, and, and I think it's very interesting. You know, uh, one of the issues that I think is, is most important is to focus on what he was doing while the attack was happening. And the reason I think that's so important is because someone who would sit and watch that attack on television, um, who would refuse multiple you know, pleas by his family, by his senior staff, to tell the mob to leave, someone who would be told that the vice president had been evacuated, and according to one report, Trump's response was, so what? Um, we know that someone handed him a note that said a civilian had been shot at the door to the House chamber. 
and he put the note on the table in front of him and continued to watch the attack happen and wouldn't tell the mob to leave. That's evil. It's evil. And, and that's, a, that's a moral issue. Um, and I, I think that it's, it's important to remind people of that. Former Congresswoman Liz Cheney, Republican from Wyoming and vice chair of the January 6th investigative committee before she lost her reelection, interviewed by presidential historian John Meacham on Wednesday at Washington National Cathedral. On Wall Street today, the Dow up 153, Nasdaq up 316, S&P up 51. Story from CNBC, inflation showed few signs of letting up in March with a key barometer. The Federal Reserve watches closely, showing that price pressures remain elevated. The Personal Consumption Expenditures Price Index, excluding food and energy, increased 2.8 percent from a year ago in March, the same as in February, the Commerce Department reported Friday. That was above the 2.7 percent estimate from the Dow Jones consensus. C-SPAN is celebrating our 45th anniversary this year. The network started in 1979 with a single cable TV channel that was dedicated to live gavel-to-gavel coverage of the U.S. House of Representatives, a commitment we continue to this day. On Thursday of this week, over a dozen former members of Congress discussed problems facing the institution of Congress, the way it operates, and some possible solutions. They were at the Penn-Biden Center for Diplomacy and Global Engagement in Washington, D.C. Jim Cooper, Democrat from Tennessee from 1983 through 95 and then 2003 through 2023, talked about cameras. We're so blessed to live in the greatest country in the history of the world, but it's way more fragile than people think, and we should never take it for granted. I'm hopeful that the energetic moderates that are in this room will be contagious and that existing members will feel some of that energy, but especially folks back home who really make all the decisions. They're our bosses. One unspoken thing that we is more touchy to talk about than pay raises is the effect of cameras on the body that changes the institution. Perhaps C-SPAN itself changed the institution, maybe for the best, maybe not so much, but the institutions we've cited here today that work are like the gym where there are no cameras. Uh, the House Intelligence Committee is one where there are no cameras. The cloakrooms, which, by the way, should be bipartisan, not partisan. There are no cameras. And those are the places uh, Tom mentioned, let's have an off-the-record session. You mean no cameras? Because this is why we don't have Oxford-style debate, because people are terrified of that video image, that meme haunting them for the rest of their careers. And oftentimes it's a comment taken out of context. Uh, Sometimes it's a, a misspeaking by a member. That happens in real life. But... We have to look at the effect of media both as a shield and a sword to uh, promote our democracy. And sometimes people back home are using these images uh, to destroy instead of to preserve the greatest country in the world. Former Congressman Jim Cooper, he was a Democrat from Tennessee, on a panel with other former House members and senators on Thursday at the Penn Biden Center for Diplomacy and Global Engagement in Washington, D.C. Thanks for listening to Washington Today. Subscribe to C-SPAN's free evening newsletter, Word for Word, and you'll get the stories making headlines in Washington sent to your inbox every day. Sign up at cspan.org slash connect. Have a good night and weekend.